This is where it all begins. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. You and I have one big problem today while we're out hunting. No, it's not that we miss occasionally. It's that it's harder and harder to find hunting property where you can just shake a hand, go on that land, treat it with respect, and have access. Hunting properties, they're getting leased up. They're getting bought up. Uh, absentee landowners buy land and then they won't let anyone on it. All of these issues and it's the number one issue why more and more hunters don't go out in the field. It's just too much trouble to find a place to hunt. Three of the best practices that I've found that have helped me when hunting public land over the years are pretty easy when you think about them but a lot of times they're overlooked. Number one, early entrances. Getting to a spot early in the morning, for me, is crucial when hunting public land especially. Here's why I do it. I'll get into a spot super, super early because I know that if other hunters are in there, normally they're gonna show up 15, 20 minutes before first light, and chances are they can push those deer to me. I'm usually farther back in there, so if they push those deer to me, I might have a crack at those deer right at first light. The second tip that I can provide is a neat tactic that Mark uses that I like to use is working the perimeters of a property, especially on really highly pressured land. The outer edges, the parts near the road, the parts that you think wouldn't even be huntable. A lot of times those are the really huntable spots and a lot of times those are the spots that no one else is going to try. The deer learn this. They learn that little areas, the nooks and crannies of these properties that they can use that they're not going to be messed with you need to do the same thing. The third thing I do is I don't broadcast my spots. I don't tell people where I'm hunting. If I'm hunting public land, I'm gonna keep it a secret. The second I tell somebody, they tell somebody else, they tell somebody else, and you have everybody hunting there. It, it, that's just reality. When you're hunting public land, you have to learn how to keep secrets, not only where you're hunting, but how you're getting to and from those spots that you're hunting. Is that selfish? Maybe but it's helped me when hunting public land because like I said, the second you broadcast it, you might as well just tell everybody. So how do you handle this issue of not having as much property at your disposal as you would like to? Well, for me, it's just trying to get as many parcels, public and private together, bunched together that I can. And then I create what I call hopscotch hunting. It's a strategy where I just bounce around property to property. Now I've done my scouting beforehand. I know where the deer are, but as you and I well know that during the hunting season, once those deer get bumped and pushed around, hey, it's a whole other game. It's like you're hunting something in Jamaica because the deer aren't doing what they were doing when you were scouting. But as you hopscotch hunt from property to property, not only do you get to see what the deer are doing, you get to study what those other hunters are doing. And that, my friends, can be just as much of a challenge, trying to figure out what the other hunters are doing, where they're pushing the deer and bumping the deer, and how to get ahead of their game as trying to get ahead of the whitetail game. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. Mossberg, built rugged, proudly American. Nikon, the next generation in hunting optics. Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply, dry it, and go hunt.
So you're probably saying, Kaiser, you forgot your rifle. I did that on purpose because the hunting season isn't open yet. Well, let me clarify that. In Wyoming, the general season is open, but I filled my tag already on that hunt. We're on to the next hunt in Wyoming, where in some units you can get a, another whitetail tag, and that season starts November 1st. I'm out here scouting, and you might be saying, Kaiser, isn't it a little late to be scouting right now? Well, it is and it isn't. I have scouted this property already several times. I know kind of where the whitetails are, but as these heavy frosts are occurring right now, different transitions with the rut occurring, these deer are shifting a little bit. So we're scouting on the go. I know where those whitetails are gonna be. I know where they wanna be, but I need to pinpoint it. So we're spending our time in between seasons trying to find where these whitetails are. This frost right here on the food source, that's having a big significant factor on where these deer are transitioning and shifting. Hunting is all about strategy, right? Well, most of your strategy is focused on the deer itself. And that's what I'm trying to do on this hunt. But sometimes you get sidetracked, and I'm sure a lot of times you're just like me. You're hunting properties that other hunters also share with you, whether it's public or private. So you've got this balancing act. You've got to have a strategy for the deer, but you also have to have a strategy for the other hunters. Wyoming has a ton of open country, but only limited riparian zones where the whitetails spend the bulk of their time. So what we have to do on these two properties is outthink not only the whitetails, but the other hunters. Here's a good example. We got to this property at midday. I was gonna get set up and watch a river bottom area. When I got over there, looked down from where I was kind of just glassing and scouting, there were other hunters. Cole and I ran into this last year too, same thing. Every day the guys come in here and push the deer out. So thinking, trying to think ahead and outthink the other hunters, it finally hit me. I'm gonna go to a little corner of the property that I've never seen any other hunters on. Yet that property, that little corner anyway on that property, gets a good traffic flow of whitetails. I slipped in there, set up, started glassing the bottom below me and the little ribbon of brush and timber in front of me, and I immediately began to see deer. The weather hasn't changed much from this morning, except that that wet stuff has turned to white stuff. But the big thing that's changed is these deer have laid up all day. We're seeing a lot of activity. Now, like almost every scenario I get in, we're hunting fence lines. We're hunting one sanctuary where they don't do a lot of hunting on that side of the fence. And another area where, well, they do a heck of a lot of hunting where I'm hunting. And it's not just me. It's about 20 or 30 other guys. But it's the way it is in America today. You're kind of limited to where you can get to hunt. So we're going after it. So to bring some of those sanctuary bucks, they're in a sanctuary city over there, over to our side of the fence, we're gonna try some rattling. We're hoping that they're hungry after laying up in this wet stuff all day. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Thompson Center, America's master gun makers. Analogix, protect your herd with the power of science. And by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies, there is no substitute. After encountering other hunters push the deer out on his first option for land to hunt, Deer and Deer Hunting's Mark Kaiser was forced to go with plan B. 
So Mark's plan B wasn't ideal. It was the same landowner's land, but on the other side of the road and a really small little piece of it in the corner. Why not give it a try? Plan B is to watch a narrow little gap, just a brush line where the deer come out of another property, they jump the fence. I only got a few short shooting lanes to get them if, if, if they jump the fence, but that's the strategy today. What am I gonna look for in this hunt? Well, it's starting to look like we're just gonna shoot the first decent buck we see. There's a lot of bucks here in Wyoming. The whitetail numbers are real high. I'm not really looking for mature deer because no one else is. There's just so much hunting pressure. We're just gonna shoot a nice buck, the first good one we see, put him in the freezer and move on to another hunt. But it's all about strategy. If we can get even a decent young buck down, I think we've been successful on this hunt. As the sun set and darkness began to filter in, maybe 15, 20 minutes left to shooting light, a buck did show up. He come across the fence, worked right in front of me at about 150 yards, easy shot as I had, was on my shooting sticks. I could have went prone if I needed to, but he wasn't just quite big enough. Plus, it was early in the hunt. Why shoot a young buck so early on when I still don't know exactly what's out there? I let him walk on, watch some of the bigger bucks across the fence do their rutting activity, scraping, all those other things. And at the end of shooting light, I'd had a pretty good night. Nobody come in, ruined my hunt. I think the prospects probably looked good. Something could happen there. Well, with that little buck setting the course, a big buck or a series of does with a big buck in tow could happen. You've seen it before, I've seen it before. When one deer goes through an area and doesn't set off any alarms or red flags, then the other deer will follow. That little buck is traveling by himself, but what I've been seeing as I've been glassing the last few days hunting is that a lot of these bucks are still kind of bachelored up a little bit. They're not you know, buddy, buddy, side by side. I think we'll just keep watching that corridor there. That's a good little travel corridor. It hits up with this little brush pocket that I was talking about that is a major travel corridor. We might get another buck to come through there or two or 10 before shooting lights over. Then I spotted another ghost. That ghost made his way through the brush so fast, I never got to see, was it a buck? Was it a doe? The next time I was likely to see him, he was gonna pop right out in front of me. I scanned as much as I could that brush to see if there was antlers on that deer. Then I got to thinking, I better get my gun up. When he comes out, he may see me with my binocular. As I was lifting up my gun, getting it ready, there he was, standing. He had already popped out and I think he saw me. He was staring right up at me. He started escaping the instant I depressed the trigger. Boom! Oh man. <laughs> All right. I uh I got to admit, I thought I was better at judging deer when than I am. When I saw this deer come through the brush, I swore it was a 4x4, four four, but it was thick brush. So you got to give me a little bit of Benefit of the doubt, this is a beautiful five by five Wyoming whitetail with big brow tines. Oh, and his tongue hanging out. Come on, buddy, look good for the camera. I'm excited. Look at that. Five by five whitetail, do it yourself, honey. We have been in pressured, up, just tons of hunting pressure here. People all over us. I drove into this spot today, it was covered up with hunters. So I went to one little corner of this property that I knew 
where very few people would go to, but I knew it also had a good travel flow of deer. And that's exactly what we're seeing here today. <sighs> Look at the brows on this buck. That there is a gorgeous Wyoming whitetail. Coming up, John Eberhardt provides insights on his strategies for how to hunt public and pressured land. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. One thing I refer to when I'm going out of state and even in Michigan is I refer to these Delorme maps. And in Michigan, uh, when you're hunting public land and knock on doors for free permission properties, I've probably hunted over 100 different parcels in Michigan because I'm losing property all the time. You know, you kill a decent buck and then all of a sudden the owners of the property that gave you free permission, they've got a nephew or somebody that wants to hunt and as soon as they know they killed a big buck off the property, you're out there in. So you're always playing that game of trying to get new property in, in conjunction with the public land. But on out of state hunts, what I tried, to, what I've always done, and I've hunted in five different states, is I've always bought a Delorme map first. Obviously, Google aerial maps on on there once you want once you want to key in on a specific area. But what a lot of hunters make a mistake of doing is they want to go to areas where there's a lot of timber. Everybody thinks big timber is awesome, and that's just not the case. This, this page, for instance, in this Delorme map, up in here you got a lot of green, hilly. You can tell it's hilly by the undulations on the map. Same deal down in here. In here it's relatively flat. So what you want to do is you want to go to an ag area where you're going to have, you know, typically if you go during the rut, all the crops are going to be cut. So basically that confines the deer traffic. You know, all the corn, they're not bedding in the corn anymore. And you also want to look for zones where there's a lot of watersheds. Because basically watersheds are always going to have security cover along them. So once all the crops are down, you know, that's going to be a natural transition zone is through those watersheds. And then typically what I do, once I find a couple counties where I want to go hunting out of state, then I typically order plat books. Plat books from some of these uh, low uh, population states, they have the phone numbers and they show you where the people live. So it's real easy to just cold call and get permission. And if you can't get permission, the ideal scenario is to find some decent public land in that same type of vicinity that borders a private ag. And then while you're out there, talk to everybody. Talk to the attendant at the gas station. Talk to the people at the bar when you're eating lunch. Talk to everybody. I like property that's about 80% ag, 80 to 90% ag. Uh, 10 to 20 percent timber. And when you're looking at aerial maps, don't be fooled what you see. Until you know what type of pressure the area has, you can't just go on an aerial map and say, oh my god, look at this beautiful pinch point. This is going to be where I'm going to set my locations. Until you go someplace and actually step foot on the property, you can't do that. You, you're probably going to be dealing with some sort of competition on the property or on the bordering properties. Definitely stick more to ag than timber. You'll be much, much more successful on a short-term hunt. You know, I love to use my Thompson Center muzzle loaders during gun season and also especially during muzzle loader season. But a couple things that I want to be sure after the season is over or before the next season starts is that my guns are clean, clear, and dry. This is the key to any muzzle loader. And it's simple, it just takes a few easy steps. Okay, so first off, clean. You want to make sure this thing is clean when you put it away because that is a scourge of any muzzle loader. If you get water or any kind of condensation, just a little bit of moisture, it's going to rust things, it's going to corrode things, it's going to make it really hard for this thing to shoot accurately for year after year after year. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to crack it open and I'm going to remove the breech plug. The breech plug is the furnace. It needs to be clear of any kind of corrosion and especially it needs to be dry. And after it's all dry, we're going to put a bit, little bit of lube on there that's going to keep it nice and seasoned until the next time we use it. So the nice thing about the Strike, it's got this really easy to remove breech plug cover and then the breech plug just pops right out of there. No tools needed. So we can get the breech plug out of there, we can take a look at it and see how it's working. So you want to know the secret to keep that breech plug that I can see light through it, and that's the key to a breech plug. You just gotta be able to see light through it because that's where the fire's gonna go. It's a little pick, these, these things are awesome. It's a little pick that I keep in my box here, and basically it allows me to get in there and remove anything that might be plugging that airway, but it's, it's perfect. 
this breech plug's ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this aside and now I'm just gonna check the bore of my gun to be sure. The bore of my gun is really clean. Now I could run another patch through here or two, or I could you know, try to scrub it out if there's anything in there. You can take a little light, shine it in there to see if there's anything in here. I know this is clean, we don't have to work on it anymore. So this, we just basically have to put back together. I'm gonna to take the breech plug, I'm putting it back into the bore, seating it nice and firmly, and then be doubly sure I'm going to wipe out the breech plug cover and I'm going to reapply a little bit. Uh, well, they, they, they call it Gorilla Grease. There's all sorts of different things. There's seasoning patches you can use, but I'm just going to take a little dab. It's just going to keep this thing from seizing up after we shoot it a couple times and it gets a little bit of that, that blowback from the Pirate X. Okay, so we're all set with that. We open the gun back up. We seat this back on there. So one last thing I'll do before closing that up is I'm just going to get a little bit of gun oil and I'm going to put it on the working mechanisms. Get that down in there. Just get that nice and, and lubed. I don't want to get it into the breech plug hole. We don't want oil in there. We want to keep that nice and dry. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to oil down my gun like I would any other firearm. A nice light coating, get it nice and dry, put it away, and we'll be all set for when deer season comes.